Hello, my name is Dr. Cindy Grines. I'm the associate editor of JSKY and the chief scientific officer at Northside Hospital Cardiovascular Institute in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm honored to represent JSKY and editor in chief, Dr. Alexander Lansky. You can find us online at jsky.org and follow us on X, formerly known as Twitter, at myjsky. And remember, JSKY is the um, home of all official Sky documents. We're here today to discuss an important document published in JSKY entitled Early Clinical Outcomes of Patients with Stress-Induced Cardiomyopathy Receiving Acute Mechanical uh, Support in the United States. I'm joined by an esteemed panel of Sky leaders and experts, including uh, Carlos Davila, who is an assistant professor of medicine at Yale, and uh, Bill O'Neill, who is the medical director of the Center for Structural Heart Disease at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit. Welcome, Bill and Carlos. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Grimes. Uh, I'd like to thank Sky for the opportunity and, and the panelists uh, and moderators for their time. It, it's such an honor to, to spend this couple of minutes with, with titans on the field, like Dr. O'Neill and Dr. Grimes. So this is an analysis that we put together after facing a couple of challenges, quite, quite challenging quite cases of stress-induced cardiomyopathy complicated by cardiogenic shock, refractory to inotropes and difficult to support. There is limited data on this particular entity, uh, thus we thought it was worth putting together. I have nothing to disclose. So a little bit of the background, the incidence of stress-induced cardiomyopathy has increased over time. Uh, based on the registry data, around 10% of these cases uh, can present with cardiogenic shock with an overall in-hospital mortality of 5%. And I think importantly, there are different mechanisms leading to cardiogenic shock in this patient. Uh, it could be a case of acute pump failure. 30% of patients uh, develop uh, LVOT obstruction, severe LVOT obstruction and others develop severe dynamic mitral regurgitation. So here we start to describe the reported incidents, the use of mechanical secretory support devices, and outcomes in patients with a stress in those cardiomyopathy complicated by cardiogenic shock using a national administrative database. I think importantly, the definition of cardiogenic shock has evolved from these three clinical variables to now a more practical definition using several markers of hypoperfusion and hypotension that were well summarized in the SKY's clinical expert consensus statement a couple of years ago. We now treat cardiogenic shock as an spectrum ranging for patients at, uh, at risk to patients in extremis and anything in between with the understanding that there are different prognostic factors at different stages of, of, of cardiogenic shock. We also know that the etiology of cardiogenic shock is an important determinant of outcomes, which is not the same a patient presenting with acute AMI shock. They have a mortality of around 40-50%, regardless of what we've done so far, uh, compared to patients with heart failure cardiogenic shock, which uh, they have a, a better outcomes, likely because they have chronicity, uh, systemic neurohormonal activation, and other factors. But even within heart failure cardiogenic shock, we still have to describe different entities. It's not the same a patient with non ischemic cardiomyopathy, infiltrative cardiomyopathy, or in this case, stressed induced cardiomyopathy. So, for this particular analysis, we examined uh, the National Readmission Database. It's a database that is uh, accessed publicly and it's uh, been published in multiple analyses. Uh, we looked at um, uh, in-hospital mortality, 30 days readmission, and other secondary outcomes that you can see here. Uh, our first analysis identified 150,000 patients that were coded with the stress-induced cardiomyopathy, and out of those, 2,200 received any sort of acute mechanical circulatory support devices. Uh, to try to uh, clean up the data, we excluded uh, simultaneous coding with acute coronary syndromes, PCIs, or more than one device during uh, index admission. 
With that, we end up with around 900 patients, and here's the breakdown, breakdown of devices that the patients received. Balloon pump being the most common in 67% of the cases, Impella around 21% of the cases, and ECMO in 11% of the cases. When looking at demographics, which I didn't include here, there were uh, similarly in all groups. Um, the only major difference was that ECMO were younger patients, and the use of right heart cath was uh, the lowest in ECMO compared to Impella. One of the initial observations that I, I, I like to point out, and I love to hear the input from our moderators, is the temporal trend uh, used on, on these devices. With a significant increase uh, use of impeller devices over time, compared to a significant decrease in the use of intraortic balloon pump uh, over the past uh, four years. And these were significant for, um, for trend analysis. And this central figure summarizes uh, most of the findings. Uh, I think um, um, and we'll get into the discussion about the limitations of this database. But importantly, 18% um, of patients that received the balloon pump had in-hospital mortality, compared to 29% uh, that received an impeller and 37% that went on ECMO. This was statistically significant, uh, the difference am amongst groups. Similarly, other outcomes were, um, or complications were uh, seen more frequently in patients that received larger devices, like the Impella and ECMO. And 30-day readmissions were the highest in patients that received Impella. This number in ECMO is likely a, a representation of patients that did not survive uh, to be discharged and be readmitted. Uh, when adjusting for Available variables, mostly demographics, age, gender, um, BMI, number of comorbidities, and different comorbidities. Patients that received uh, ECMO and Impella were more likely uh, to have the um, uh, outcome study. Similarly, readmissions were more likely to occur in patients that received Impella. I think one of the, um, the reviewers uh, came uh, back to us and recommended or suggested that we put together as, uh, an algorithm for use of mechanical support devices in this particular uh, subgroup of patients. And I think this is an area that we can spend a little bit of time um, uh, with, with Dr. Grimes and Dr. O'Neill based on their experience. We put this together um, based on little data, as you know, there is little data on, on stress-induced cardiomyopathy, <clears throat> but I think in these patients, it's important to make the right diagnosis, right? And this is a diagnosis of exclusion. So these patients should undergo a coronary angiogram and a complete right heart catheterization to obtain hemodynamics. Once they are uh, diagnosed with cardiogenic shock, there should, be, there should be assessment of the presence of LBFT gradient or not. And if that's the case, and patients are in advanced stages of cardiogenic shock, we should consider immediate support with uh, devices that were further after the reduction might not, might not be detrimental. If you think about it, a patient with an LBOT gradient, if you put a balloon pump in, that further reduction if after low might be detrimental for that patient. So in those cases, we recommend devices that are not um, uh, provokers of LVOT gradient, in that case, uh, in this case, an impella. And in those patients that uh, develop systemic hemodynamic collapse or hypoxic, consider ECMO. Conversely, if there is uh, no significant LVOT gradient, uh, we could be a little bit more conservative in these patients, especially in early stages of shock, A and B. Uh, try uh, alpha drainage uh, uh, inotropes uh, with close monitor of progression. And if there is still progression, uh, we, we should advocate for early mechanical support uh, using um, uh, non-stress induced cardiomyopathy recommendations, which as a community we're still working on. But I think this is an area that um, uh, I thought we could focus some of our, our attention during the discussion. So uh, in conclusion, this is a relatively uh, straightforward uh, analysis of a national administrative database. Uh, here we provide insights in the use of mechanical circulatory de devices, the variables associated with in-hospital outcomes in patients with a stress in those kind of myopathy complicated with cardiogenic shock, 
The most common device in this cohort uh, continues to be a balloon pump um, with an increased temporal trend in impeller. Largest devices have more complications, vascular complications and post-procedural bleeding. Similar results have been shown in other analyses. Um, given the nature of this particular database, uh, there are significant limitations, right? We don't have uh, clinical, uh, some, too much clinical information or, or intra-procedural information like hemodynamics, uh, lactate, renal function, and therefore we could not uh, adjust for sky stages, which uh, could lead to selection bias. And, and I think uh, one of the important things as a group is that we continue to pu push for objective and or universal profile on patients presented with cardiogenic shock to better define and improve treatment in, in all patients presented with, with this uh, entity. I think we can conclude that having 40% or 30% mortality despite our best effort, it continues to be unacceptable. And for that, we need uh, uh, to further evaluate all, all these cases. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll be interested to hear uh, Dr. Grimes and Dr. O'Neill's uh, thoughts. Yeah, excellent uh, job, uh, Carlos. Um, I wondered, you know, you mentioned that uh, you think that uh, uh, cardiac catheterization is absolutely necessary in order to make uh, this diagnosis. And I agree with you, but I, I have a lot of uh, colleagues who said, who will make co comments, so oh, this echo finding is you know, consistent with uh, this disease process. And so do you know in your database how many of these um, individuals actually had a catheterization to confirm the diagnosis? All of them. Uh, for this particular analysis, they all had to have a coronary angiogram. Okay. And, and none of them uh, could have either PCI or uh, any interventions coronary-wise. So we excluded those. Okay. So it has to be clean, clean coronaries with mm -hmm. cardiac shock and a code for stress in this kind of myopathy. Right. Now, in your algorithm, I guess maybe you could go back to your algorithm because when you think of the mechanism of uh, uh, stress induced cardiomyopathy, often it's thought to be due to excessive um, adrenergic tone or, you know, um, uh, too much uh, dobutamine or dopamine can induce this type of uh, uh, disease process. And so I wonder if uh, among your um, vasopressors, whether you would distinguish between inotropic agent versus vasoconstrictive uh, agents. I see you talking about alpha, alpha mm -hmm. adrenergic. But what about over in the area where there's no gradient? When you say inotropic therapy, or which ones are you referring to there? Yeah, here we thought without an LVO2 obstruction, you can use uh, uh, any inotropic therapy. You can start with the vitamin or based on your on, on your hemodynamics and, and whatnot. Um, so I think the concern here is that uh, regardless of the inotropic therapy, without an LVO2 gradient, uh, you can start with the vitamin and dopamine, just like uh, uh, any other form of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy complicated with cardiogenic shock. Conversely, here, uh, when we we did mention alpha-adrenergic vasopressors to counteract the LVOT gradient. But are you concerned that the theoretical mechanism is uh, uh, too much uh, inotropic uh, therapy you know, baseline inotropic, uh, whether it's drugs, whether it's exogenous or whether it's endogenous, because that's the point, that's what the stress and stress-induced cardiomyopathy refers to, right? There's excessive release of dopamine type of um, hormones from uh, the broken heart syndrome or whatever is going on at that time. So I guess yeah. uh, you know, it's all theoretical, but uh, Bill? Sure. Thank you, Carlos. And thank you for putting that together. I think it's wonderful. Uh, I would really completely agree with you that the first thing you want to do is you want to check the patient. So the patients are in shock. They need vasopressors. That's how that's that's what gets them in. They often have ST elevation and it, it mimics an anterior MI almost to the T. But when you do the ventricular gram, then you find that this sort of octopus pot where there's ballooning of the apex and then uh, conversely, in patients that have a lot of hypertrophy, they have posterobasal hyperkinesis. And so then you can develop a gradient. I think that's when the patients really start getting into trouble because uh, the more uh, uh, inotropes you give them, the more.
more uh, the uh, poster basal area contracts and the higher the gradient. And, and so I think that you have to break that cycle. And, and our, my preferred method is to try to put an impella in so that you can support the patient, get the blood the systemic blood pressure up, and then down titrate the vasopressors. And I think that's kind of, uh, but, I, but I agree with you that you really have to divide those patients. Actually, the ones that don't develop a gradient are a little bit easier to deal with. And those are the ones that don't end up, uh, you know, with hemodynamic compromise. So uh, I think that, um, that we've seen a lot of patients that have uh, concentric hypertrophy, and then when they develop this apical ballooning, uh, the apex becomes akinetic or dyskinetic, and there's compensatory hyperkinesis of the posterior basal area, and that's where the gradients happen. So uh, I would really, I would really agree with you to to go that route, uh, and. Um, it, it's the the thing in your analysis is a little confounding, as you suggested, is that uh, there's a higher mortality in the um, in the ECMO patients and in the impella patients, and I think there's probably some selection bias where people that are younger and more sick end up with more aggressive support, and that's probably what's causing some of the uh, some of the higher mortality. If they're not quite as sick, they get put on a balloon pump and they tend to do do better. But I don't think that there's any, I can't see a mechanistic reason why balloon pumping would be better than Impella and honestly why ECMO would be worse. I think that just the patients get more invasive support and are much more ill. It, it would be wonderful if you had a sky shock classification and baseline to try to figure out you know, who are D and E cases and who are A, B, and C. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, one of the message that we put in this paper is it's not about the outcomes based on devices, but the limitation of these databases and how we should recommend some of these uh, NCVR-based databases to start including sky stages uh, shock uh, and when we fill them in uh, um, so, so we can avoid reporting and selection bias. And also, I, I completely agree. I think uh, I had a case, one of the cases that I, I wanted to share, I was just constrained by this the amount of slides, is what you just described, um, Dr. O'Neill. It's a patient that uh, was pretty sick, had a significant LVOT rating of uh, 90 millimeter per mercury, gets a balloon pump in, and it does worse. So we right. took, him back to, took him back to the lab, put an impeller in, we were able to, um, stabilize the patient, and uh, over time, we were able to come off pressors, and the patient did well. So it has nothing to do with, um, I don't want to say nothing to do, but it has less to do with the device, but more to do with the hemodynamic profiling, and the severity of the entity, and, and the timing of intervention. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think your message is, is really good and practical for the interventionalist and for the, uh, for the clinical cardiologist. If you have a patient who has stress-induced cardiomyopathy or you have a circumstance, a lady that you know, gets shocked because she, she, she's told her husband died or something, then develops chest pain, ST elevation, and you take, a, take that patient to the cath lab, then I think uh, measuring a gradient is, is incredibly important at a baseline. And if you've got a high gradient, then a balloon pump won't work. Uh, impella and ECMO would, but you have to recognize that. And the other thing I think is really crucial is that uh, uh, inotropes make things worse. Mm -hmm. And so the whole point is to support them mechanically so you can down titrate the inotropes and they'll get better right away. Mm -hmm. And just keep in mind, you can't use a pigtail catheter, obviously, when you have a gradient like that. You have to use an end hole catheter, like a coronary uh, device. Mm -hmm. Yeah, speaking of the limitations of a lot of databases, I'd like to just uh, bring up um, an article that Alexander Lansky published about a year ago in AJC, and it was using the Premier database, which actually has a lot of clinical and angiographic variables. And uh, she found that in an unadjusted um, um, look at comparisons of bloom pump versus Impella, uh, similar to what you showed, there was a doubling of mortality in the Impella group. But then when she did the multivariable analysis, looking at clinical, um, um, the demographics plus clinical plus angiographic, what she found was actually there's a significant improvement in survival in those patients treated with Impella compared to balloon pumps. So it's interesting how it completely flipped when you had the appropriate variables to look at. Yeah. 
Absolutely. That's why I think um, the, the, the trials looking at cardiogenic shock moving forward, and, and both of you are involved in those, um, are, are very important in describing all these variables, uh, hemodynamic variables and systemic variables, lactic acid, uh, LFDs, and management in the ICU. So we can stop comparing the device head to head, but understand cardiogenic shock as a, as a, as a systemic problem that requires early support. The other thing that you notice is that there are some of these patients that develop severe mitral regurgitation, and that all kind of goes with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with the intense hyperkinesis of the posterior basal area. Uh, the anterior leaflet actually gets pulled open in systole, and you get severe MR, and that all kind of comes around with, with support, with, uh, with either uh, uh, impella or ECMO support. Um, the MR decreases, and I think that's, but you have to understand that, and you have to understand the mechanism in order to treat these patients properly. Right, yes, I particularly like this, uh, the sky A and B, you increase the preload, right, because you dial, then you can prevent the ventricle from collapsing so much. Consider short-acting beta blockers, which I think most of us would be reluctant to do, but we, uh, in a shock situation, but we do that all the time with patients who are have elective cases of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But no, it's good, it's, it's a very good algorithm. I don't, uh, the, over on the left-hand side, I still don't know about the inotrophic therapy, though, because if you had somebody with um, um, this disorder, right, if they uh, had the broken heart syndrome and you give them inotropes, so you might create right. a gradient potentially. Yeah, we, we did that once sending the cath lab. We actually had a patient that had, uh, that had a shock developed during a dobutamine stress echo, and we brought the patient to the cath lab, normal coronaries, and we challenged her again with the dobutamine, and the same damn thing happened. I mean, she had a huge gradient of blood pressure plummeted. So wow. I, I think there is some inciting event with high doses of suppressors. And I would con really, if you have any kind of concern about stress-induced cardiomyopathy, you can't give vasopressors. And if they're on support, then you could probably judiciously try to give beta blockers. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, this was a very stimulating uh, conversation today for Jay Sky. I want to thank uh, you, Carlos, uh, for the excellent presentation and uh, your insight into this database. And Bill, as always, you're the expert in this field and it's been very, very educational for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you.